So my task here, I want to be clear, is not so much um, to explain, to defend Trump, but rather to explain him uh, through the lens, really, of the history of political thought. So it's going to be long-ranging. I see many in the audience are expats, just like me, and so we live in two different worlds. But in my case, I live in three. When I'm back in the United States, I live, I move back and forth between the main campus and Washington and my little tiny abode, my patch of forest out on the eastern shore in Cambridge, Maryland. There are two different Americas right now. As I move, as I go into Washington, I see people partying and I see real estate prices going up and everybody's happy. And, and then there's a vast swath of America that is in deep, deep trouble. We have six of 10 of the richest counties in America circumscribing Washington, D.C., indicating that the money is flowing from the federal government to all these various organizations and people who are somehow feeding off the federal government. The other America is America of despair, drug addiction, suicide, low-paying jobs, and never-ending condescension toward flyover country. That's a bit strong, but not entirely. So what I want to do first is ask the question, why did Trump so easily take the nomination? I've been saying for years, precisely because I do live in Cambridge, Maryland, that there is going to be a populist uprising. And of course, the figure that we would look to to understand populism is Andrew Jackson, who was the president from 1829 to 1837. He said, it is to be regretted that the rich and powerful too often bend the acts of government to their own selfish purposes. The Republican Party was held together during the Cold War in a very strange way. There were five or six different factions. There were the conservatives, the economic conservatives, the cultural conservatives, the evangelicals that were brought in with Reagan, the, the post-JP2 uh, Catholics that were brought in. Because I do history of political thought, I think of these people in terms of these groups in terms of their philosophers. And so we would be talking about Edmund Burke, Friedrich Hayek, uh, John Calvin, <clears throat> Aristotle and Aquinas, anyone who has taught those people know that they, they do not hang together. And so the Republican Party hung together, <clears throat> not by virtue of internal coherence, but by virtue of what they were opposed to, namely progressivism within and the Cold War without. So after 1989, frankly, there was no reason for the Republican Party to hold together, and it was just a question of time before that party fell apart. If it wasn't Trump, it was going to be somebody else sooner or later. What I want to do next is talk about um, the post-1989 organizing principle. I tend to think of, of politics less in terms of interest groups and facts on the ground than the ideas that make them cohere. And I think uh, we had, from 1945 to 1989, a Cold War movement, the doctrine of containment. But 1989 afterwards is a fantastic experiment, which has never been performed, as far as I can tell, before. And if you're 35 or under, it's difficult to imagine the alternative you have before you. Everywhere I go around the world, I hear students in my class talking about globalization and their identities. Everywhere I go. 35, 40 years ago, those of us who are old enough to remember this, we didn't talk in those terms. So my argument is that post-1989 synthesis is, involves globalization and identity politics. I'll come to how this plays out in the university in a couple minutes. Um, it's seen to be the real state of things, <clears throat> but because I'm a political philosopher, I know that, that the, the counterpoint to that is the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648 and Hobbes' Leviathan in 1651, in which it is argued that the sovereign unit is the state and the rational citizen. What's fantastic and fascinating about the post-1989 synthesis is you have what I call a a, an above and below wager about where sovereignty can be found. It's no longer in the state. It's in, uh, it's in the transnational organizations. And so we have to have free trade, international law, global norms, and international accords about climate change. And these things are the only things that can save us. Below state, below state sovereignty, we have identity, right? It's not that we're rational citizens who resolve our problems. We're not reasonable beings. We're bearers of this or that identity uh, who are owed something by the state who will pay, <clears throat> pay our debt through ever-expanding debt financing, $19.4 trillion uh, to the end of fiscal 2016. So you have this tremendous paradox. The disembodied citizen who imagined his or her identity in relation to others and pol in politics as activism, not citizenship, and the all-important actions that are really taken involve uh, global coordination and the watchword of our times, and I've chided some of my colleagues about this, management, 
global management. In our universities, um, <clears throat> rather than standing above the fray, we have been implicated in the development of globalization and identity politics. And so, even in the School of Foreign Service, we, we tend to think here, I'll press the matter as far as I can, uh, give our students a little bit of Keynesian economics and Foucault, and we have a comprehensive program. And I think this is actually a big problem. Many years ago, Clyde will remember, uh, we insisted that the students of the School of Foreign Service have an American government requirement so they could learn the silly things like institutions and how the government worked. We don't do that now. The state and the individual rational actor is not where we are. We're thinking, we're, we're still involved in this tremendous wager that we can think of the world in terms of sub and, and supra identity politics and globalization. It's in the context of that that I, that I say that uh, there are six ideas lurking in Trump's rhetoric, and I realize lurking in is a very strange phrase, right? Does he actually have these ideas? Or if he has them, are they coherent? But let me just name the six ideas, all of which I think are a challenge to this identity politics and globalization. Borders matter. Immigration policy matters. National interests, not so-called universal interests, matter. Entrepreneurship matters. Decentralization matters. PC speech, without which identity politics is inconceivable, must be repudiated. So that, I think, is the larger picture. And so I see, politically at any rate, the, the battle being waged, and it's not just in America, it's in Europe and over Brexit as well. The, the real question before us is whether we will continue with this correlation between globalization and identity politics. That is the intellectual challenge before us. And so I would leave it at that, except for the second debate. And so I have to talk about sex and sin in Protestant America, just for a couple of minutes. Um, Trump is the very curious figure here. Because, as I discovered recently, Trump grew up in New York City, and he had a pastor um, by the name of Norman Vincent Peale, who you oldsters will know of, who wrote a book called The Power of Positive Thinking. So here's one kind of Presbyterian who really turns away from the doctrine of sin altogether. And so when Trump says crass things, and you should all go look at how crass that video is, okay? when he says crass things, the way he thinks through this problem is in terms not of sin, but of error, mistake, a little locker room talk. Now, what has become so fascinating to me is the counter reaction to Trump. And I, I don't want to leave it as just that this election is simply about globalization, identity, politics. I think it's actually a religious election, a profoundly religious election, in which you have Trump who thinks of sin as error, and then this whole other group, and I don't want to develop it, but this whole other group, which I think is Hillary Clinton, frankly, uh, that thinks in terms of very old American tropes, the trope of purity and stain. And so, the deplorables are irredeemable. Think of this as religious language, okay? Um, to be phobic is to be irredeemable. You can't talk to these people. Um, the language of purity and stain is now starting to penetrate our language of the Hillary Clinton campaign in the way that it didn't even with Obama and, and earlier on, the, the earlier great African American of the 20th century, Martin Luther King. It's not purity and stain, it was the long march through the parched desert to get there somewhere. But this is, in, in, a view, in my view, very, very, um, very troubling, uh, the development of this Puritan moment. And let me add something else. Obama was black. Hillary Clinton is white. And so to, to, to remain, I'm using religious language, to remain pure and without blemish, this is deeply religious language from the New Testament, she has to double down and call out the white people. And some of you have seen this, right? I, we have, I have to talk to the white people about their racism. And so my worry is that Obama had this a little bit, but I think that because Hillary Clinton is white, she's going to have to double down against, against whites on all of these identity groups so that she can remain pure and unblemished in their eyes. This, to me, is deeply troubling. And it's just deeply troubling on political grounds. Because I think we have made a serious mistake in setting up politics as left and conservative. There is a third alternative, which is known as liberal capital L. That term has been appropriated largely by the left, but capital L liberal has no room for these theological categories of purity and stain. Because in a liberal regime, 
there are going to be people who disagree with you, and you're going to have to render, label them as good and bad, not as good and evil. So I see this the tremendous paradox, and I'll end with this. What were Obama's slogans? Change, hope, and forward. The idea that we could completely repudiate the old order. He thought that he stood triumphantly on the threshold of taking his people to the new promised land. Martin Luther King, so he, he believes he's triumphal. Martin Luther King walked faithfully through the parched desert. Use these different images of moving the promised land, or the people to the promised land. So here you have this president who for eight years announces the end of the old era. And we have with the new, this current uh, election, a woman who is thinking very much in terms of purity and stain, and the Democratic Party that's thinking in terms of purity and stain, which I think is anathema to a liberal regime. I have lots more to say, but I just want to end with a couple of things. There are, there are three, three points. The battle for the future is not over identity politics or the state. I think identity politics and globalization has lost. The question now before us is whether we're going to have a liberal state or an illiberal state. Second, um, I think there's a tremendous danger in moving to moral language in politics. I think this somehow has to be stopped. I don't know how it is to be done. And third, and Clyde and I, will, Clyde will talk about this, and he and I will disagree to some extent. There's a tremendous crisis of authority right now uh, in the media. There are people who are in the Trump camp who simply refuse to accept as legitimate med news sources, CNN and the rest, and vice versa with respect to the so-called alt-right. This is, I think, the bigger crisis. And I don't care who wins, Trump or, or Clinton, we are going to be facing this crisis in America for the next decade or so, if not more. Thank you. So Monty Python famously would begin many of their routines by saying, and now for something completely different. I'm not going to talk about political theory. I'm going to talk very narrowly about the election. I'm going to address two questions. First of all, how is it that this election is still close? And then secondly, what could we possibly expect from the election and beyond? I think, though, no matter how big the gap in the polls is, some of the polls show a 12-point gap, some show four, but it should startle us that it's that close. Because Donald Trump is, let's be honest, catastrophically unprepared to be president. Right? He lacks the knowledge to be president. He lacks the curiosity to attain the knowledge. He's not studying. He lacks the temperament. He cannot control himself at 3 AM from tweeting insults. There are a series of scandals still to come about Donald Trump if they bother to do it. And so everyone in the party knows that. Paul Ryan knows this, right? And then secondly, Donald Trump isn't even trying, right? He's not investing any of his own money. In fact, he's taking money that he's raising and reimbursing himself for the use of his own airplane. Uh, he, he is making no effort to appeal to the voters he would need to win, which include women and minorities, right? In fact, one of those 3 a.m. tweets was against a Latina woman. Um, he's made no effort to mobilize the votes, uh, uh, get out the vote drives, and today, what's he talking about? He's bashing Paul Ryan, the House Republican leader. So, how can it be that a man who is catastrophically unprepared and who is not even trying is still somewhat close? And so, I want to talk about a couple of things. First of all, general things about elections that mean they would always be kind of close. And then a few things about Hillary Clinton and her candidacy. So first of all, we have these abstract models that predict elections. And they have a bunch of economic indicators and per capita GDP growth and unemployment rate. Those are typically pretty good right now. But as Josh says, that doesn't reflect all of America. Uh, popularity of the president. Actually, Obama's popularity numbers are pretty high right now uh, for this time in a presidency. But the most important factor often is the eight-year itch. I'm 64 years old. Only once in my lifetime has the party controlled the presidency for more than eight years. Right? There is a sense that we're tired of this. We want to try something new. And so 
Looking at all these models, they almost all predict that if the Republicans and Democrats had both nominated equally plausible candidates, Republicans would narrowly win this election. So the gap between what will happen and that model is the Trump effect. Secondly, we are a polarized nation of partisans. Many people always vote for the same party. Some of them are saying this time they'll make an exception, and some of my friends, actually Republican friends, are in agony. One of them said she would rather crawl on her knees over broken glass than vote for Hillary Clinton, but feels she must do that. But that means that the lowest a presidential candidate has gone in my lifetime is 37%, probably in a polarized time, 40% is about as low as we could expect it to be. And people are then rationalizing how they're able to do this. There's some interesting things about religion I can talk about if you want. Third, there are places in America where the economy is not so good. Uh, Josh is absolutely right. Places in Ohio and Michigan and West Virginia, my hometown, those factory jobs that used to provide a good standard of living are gone, and they are never coming back. Right? No one is speaking to those people, really. And so one of the narratives of the election is that this is an election about the forgotten white people in these little towns. But when we look at survey data, we see something slightly different. The people who support Trump are not the ones who have lost the jobs. Those people are actually Hillary Clinton people, right? <coughs> Trump's people are actually slightly above average in income, not a whole lot, but slightly above average. The single best predictor of who supports Donald Trump right now is racial resentment. As I was driving back through southern Virginia uh, in this uh, time I was back in uh, Washington a, a few days ago, a couple weeks ago, I saw more Confederate flags down there than I've ever seen in my life. Now, let's switch to Hillary Clinton, because Hillary Clinton, I think, is a much weaker candidate than the Democrats would normally have offered. On the other hand, many of the things that make her a weak candidate don't necessarily mean she would be a weak president. But what are the... She has... The highest negatives of any presidential candidate in our history, except for one, Donald Trump. So, first of all, she has the problem that she is one of the Clintons, right? They have been in public life for 24 years. There have been accumulated little problems and scandals. And so, most recent of which is this, uh, uh, these big speeches she gave to the banks and Bill Clinton has been giving to various groups for an enormous amount of money. There's just a little small uh, unseemliness about that. Secondly, Hillary Clinton is running as a woman. Um, that gives her a big disadvantage. So Bernie Sanders could shout. I think back, did you ever hear a speech he was giving that he was not shouting? But if Hillary Clinton raises her voice slightly, she's shrill. And all the networks were saying, why is he so shrill today, right? Or imagine the last presidential debate where Hillary Clinton does what Donald Trump did. Interrupted him 36 times, stalks behind him, says, I'm going to throw you in jail. You know what they'd be saying about her. Or imagine that she had been cheating on three husbands, right? And she just had a tape where she was going to grab men by whatever. You can't even imagine it, right? But you know that she would not be a competitive candidate if that was true. She's also a very private person, very obsessively so in many ways. I can understand why she is. She doesn't talk about herself on the campaign trail. We expect candidates to do that, and we especially expect women to do that. Um, that's why she has this email server, which has become a problem for her. She tends to circle the wagons when she's under assault, and that's when she dissembles, lies, whatever. Um, actually, the fact checkers say that Hillary Clinton was the second most honest of the 17 candidates running this time. But when she's telling something that's not true, it's almost always about her. And that's something that makes people not trust her as much. But for all these weaknesses, you have to realize that the Republicans have been bashing her consistently for the last six years. She was actually the most admired woman in America when she was Secretary of State. Uh, but it is Benghazi, 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 Vince, Vince Foster's suicide, uh, and so forth. And so it has been a very concentrated effort to drive up her negatives, which has worked pretty well. Okay, 
Switching gears just quickly, what do we expect? Well, all of the models say that Hillary Clinton is going to win. Uh, 538 today gives uh, Donald Trump 11% chance. Um, but surveys have been wrong in the world. Would it be possible that the surveys are all wrong this time? Not very likely, but here's how it could be possible. Maybe some of the people who are going to vote for Donald Trump are ashamed to admit it. All my friends who are voting for Donald Trump, my uh, Facebook friends back in West Virginia, are very proud of it, actually. But it would be possible to imagine, but I think the odds are very good that it's going to be a very big victory. Um, but here's what's troubling. Donald Trump is out there today and yesterday and the day before doubling down on his claim that the only way he can lose is if there's fraud. The only way he could lose Florida, which is administered by a Republican government, would be if there was voter fraud. That there are tens of thousands of illegals pouring across the border ready to vote for Hillary Clinton. That in Philadelphia, the blacks are going to vote again and again and again, and he's encouraging his supporters to go and try to stop them, okay? Now, this leaves, this leaves us with two problems. One is, what if he challenges the results? Well, what if he challenges the results in Pennsylvania? We can't do a recount because Pennsylvania, in their limited wisdom, has voter machines that don't print receipts. And so the number on the machine is what we're stuck with. Richard Nixon actually probably did get ripped off. He probably did win the 1960 election, but rather than submit the country to the kind of chaos that his challenge would bring, he stepped down, which tells you something, right? Richard Nixon is a much more honorable man than Donald Trump. But he's telling his supporters to go into Philadelphia and challenge voters who they think are voting unfairly. Those people are going to be brown or black, right? And so what could possibly go wrong with armed white men from rural Pennsylvania going into the inner city and challenging brown voters? This is what he's encouraged them to do. But in my case, and I was talking to Josh about this earlier, what's the best outcome for me personally? And as a professor, I can profess a little bit. I think Hillary Clinton would, would winning would be the best I could hope for. Maybe the Democrats get the Senate, but you know the Republicans will hold their first impeachment vote probably a few months into her presidency, right? And you know that what Donald Trump has been angling for for a while is Trump TV. Actually, they've leaked that out now. So he will be on TV repeatedly saying the election was stolen from me and Hillary Clinton should be in jail. So unfortunately, I come away with a rather pessimistic view of the future of American politics. Uh, it's been the ugliest election in my lifetime. I hope when my children are in their deathbeds, they can say it was the ugliest election in their lifetime also. A very thought-provoking uh, comment. I really uh, appreciate that. Uh, let me uh, start off by asking both a question about the overall nature of uh, American politics and what this election says. Uh, as we've seen, uh, and as uh, both of you have alluded to, uh, the election has been, this election has been a particularly dirty one. We have seen um, rhetoric of the kind we haven't seen in, uh, in, in the United States, at least in my lifetime, uh, and in many other countries. Uh, is this uh, election an aberration, or is this indicative of a longer term trend uh, in, uh, in public discourse in the United States? I, I would say both. Um, I would say that it is indicative of a longer term trend because many of the things that Trump is saying have been said by other Republicans, just not quite as meanly. So Republicans have been talking about massive voter fraud for many years, even though all of our studies suggest it doesn't really exist. Uh, they've been playing the race card in elections for a very long time. Trump does it in a nastier way. but. There is something just unique about Donald Trump, right? That all the other candidates running this time, you know, none of them were quite at this level of instability and so forth. So 
um, I, you know, hopefully he doesn't set the, lower the bar permanently for the rest of the country. I think uh, to talk about the question of acrimony in public life, we would have to talk about the internet because it makes possible the kinds of comments that we would never make face to face to one another. So I think that's part of what is going on here. Um, so I'm pessimistic about the near term, but, but I'm actually very hopeful about the long term. I don't remember who it was, but the saying goes, ideas become movements and movements become rackets. And it strikes me that both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party have become rackets. Uh, and I will say it would have been much more interesting if Bernie Sanders had won. The reason why Trump was able to pull it off was, as I indicated in my comments, the Republican Party was a loose coalition of five different kinds of groups. And it could not be held together, but the Democratic coalition has been held together. It's been very tightly bound. So um, uh, Alexis de Tocqueville famously says, after the battle comes the lawgiver. Trump is not the lawgiver. I concede he's not the statesman. But it strikes me that we're, I I'm less disturbed about him. I mean, of course I'm disturbed about him, but I'm less disturbed about him because I know that for, for ideas that have become institutionalized to change, it's not gonna be sweet. And it's gonna be very ugly, and I think Bernie Sanders would have had one species, much more civilized than Donald Trump, to be sure. But I think we're going through this moment in America where the old ideas are being deeply challenged. The neoconservatives have been repudiated. But Hillary Clinton and, and identity politics and what I call the new elect of purity and stain, this is, I think, a serious issue for us now, Trump is trying to rip it apart. He is not a lawgiver. He's going to battle. And I understand why. He's not very presidential. But I think this sort of thing, whether it's Trump or somebody else, is going to have to happen for us to get new ideas and have parties that aren't rackets that the people out in the fields can see as rackets. Thank you. Um, one of the things we heard from um, Josh is a very... Uh, clear enunciation of what Trump's ideas are. He actually, Trump does have ideas. There were six that uh, Josh mentioned. What are the three or four clear ideas that Hillary has, apart from continuing the status quo of the last eight years? Well, so Hillary Clinton believes uh, that the wealthy should pay more taxes and that the disadvantaged should have more benefits from government. She believes in an active government. Her tax plan would increase taxes on the top 1% pretty substantially. Um, she would then expand health care uh, offerings and so forth. So kind of classic democratic social policy. In foreign policy, she's pretty much a neocon. I mean, she's actually a very interventionist kind of person, and so um, she's, she's on the hawkish side of uh, the party. And then Josh has mentioned the identity politics. I think from Hillary's point of view, she would not say, she would not frame it quite the way Josh does, but she would say yes, that there is, this is a moment where women's rights need to be recognized, right? And this is a moment where yeah, all lives matter, but we're focusing on black lives right now because they're the ones getting shot down in the streets. And so I think at a certain level, part of her thing is to make sure we extend the social fabric to include all Americans. Thank you. Uh, in, in so far as foreign policy is concerned, one of the things you mentioned is that uh, Trump uh, is um, a nationalist. And... Um, in comparison to Hillary, who, is, um, who advocates intervention, uh, Trump is someone who's advocating probably less intervention. Uh, can you elaborate on that in terms of uh, what a Trump, potential Trump presidency would mean in terms of America's profile in the world? There's a great deal of uncertainty about that. I think one reading of him is he has all this bluster that he would use excessive military force. And there is a danger of that. But I think, on the other hand, and here I will dovetail with what Clyde is saying, uh, what's interesting about Trump is that the neocons and the neoliberals <clears throat> still believe in something like a universal democratic consensus. And so they're using whether a ruler is pro-democracy as a basis of calling it legitimate or not. So in Egypt, in Syria, in Libya, this is the cr 
criteria used to establish whether this person is friendly or foe. I think Trump's view is, no, stop with the purity and stain. This regime is democratic, this regime is not. Forget all that. For Trump, they're not, they're not pure and stained, there are winners and losers. That's what he's always talking about. I want to be a winner. It's an entirely different moral vocabulary. And his view is, that you stop thinking in terms of the purity of democracy and the impurity of stain. Start thinking in terms of putting your nation first. It can be excessive, to be sure. But I think the, the refreshing part of this could be, I'm not saying it will be, it could be that he, he assesses each case on a strictly nationalist basis. Is this in our national interest? And if I may, uh, the, the term that the Obama administration used was not allies, it was partners. This is really important. Because a partner is something that's contingent, comes and goes, uh, it's contextual. But an ally assumes that the world is constituted so that war is always possible and likely, and it will always happen. And so what Trump is reminding us of is that we are living not in a post-war world, we're living in a world where there will always be war, and so-called universal alliances will never hold together in those circumstances, and so you have to think in terms of your nation first. My worry is that the talk about pulling money back from NATO is not simply a prompt to the Europeans to pay their fair share, but rather he really does mean to pull back. And if you've extended outwardly, and this is the neoconservative movement, militarily, and then you pull back, you're gonna have all sorts of problems. So I think my own view is, I think we've tried this democracy everywhere for far too long. I'm not a purist about this, and I don't think Trump is either. I think it could be a good thing, but it could end up in nationalist bluster as well. Can I just uh, say one thing about that? The, the part of uh, Trump's foreign policy that worries me the most is his love affair with Putin, right? So you can look at a series of statements that he makes, which are basically just apologetics for, you know, so Crimea really belongs to Russia, and Russia doesn't have any troops in the Ukraine, and Putin probably hasn't ever murdered anyone, and, you know, no, it wasn't the Russians who did the hacking, and on and on and on. Um, so he praises dictators, but really Putin in particular, and uh, there's something really odd about that. And though, so when you mention the NATO pullback, you know, that is like we're not guaranteeing we'll protect all of our NATO allies if they haven't paid their fair share. I combine that not just with the nationalism, but with this really strongly pro-Russian language. Can I add something to this? Every president that comes along says, I got a handle on that Russian. I mean, Obama did too. They learn very quickly that they don't. But there's, a, but there's a significant question that is lurking. I understand the difficulty. That's lurking in the threat to pull back uh, NATO involvement. I talk to my European friends, my never again European friends. And I say, if the Russians were to advance west, where would you draw the line? Where would you finally arm yourselves militarily and defend the region? And I can't get a clear answer. And under those circumstances, it's simply not clear to me that America can send troops all the way to Ukraine to stop Putin. Now, is this to say that we should say, come on down? No, I'm not saying that. But I think that there's a very real question in post-war Europe about its commitment to war. Uh, turning to domestic politics, uh, for those of us who are not intimately familiar with American politics, what role do interest groups play in elections? Well, in a normal election, they play in a very big role, right? Interest groups um, communicate to their members, um, they do endorsements, they run advertising, they mount get out the vote drive, so people from interest groups go door to door and say, Clyde, have you voted yet? Why haven't you done it? Let's get that ballot in. You need a ride to the polls and so forth. That's Hillary Clinton's model. She's got a very strong network of Democratic interest groups and she's got the party apparatus in place. Donald Trump has pretty much just not done that, right? He's pretty much doing it all on his own. He's not even working with the part state party organizations. Um, so many of the Republican interest groups have backed away from him, the Chamber of Commerce, many normal uh, Republican uh, groups. <coughs> Uh, just a little bit nervous. You know, the Koch brothers, for example, not willing to fund his campaign. So, um, but normally, an interest group, it plays a vital role in helping people see what the candidate is saying that's relevant to them. What are they saying about the environment? What are they saying about women's rights, about abortion? 
and then helping their people understand what they need to do to get involved. Let me add to what Clyde is saying. So the one, thing, one of the things I really do worry about Trump comes back to the internet. So Clyde was saying that the Clinton machine is based on a ground game of people who have tight connections, people meeting face to face. This is what Tocqueville thinks you have to have for democracy. But Trump is moving directly to Twitter and Twitter is utterly isolated individuals. And so he's trying from the top to motivate people at the very bottom without any reference to the actual groups that are necessary for democracy to work. From Pla on Platonic grounds and on Tocquevillian grounds, this is an invitation to tyranny. So I'm very, very worried about that part of it. But is this an ironic source of popularity that he has, that he has cut, cut through the middlemen of, of politics and gone directly to the masses? Well, it's a brilliant strategy, and he, he knew I always tell my friends and colleagues that uh, politics is rhetoric and governance is policy. So if your media strategy is Twitter and everybody's on Twitter, the only way you're going to be heard is if you're incredibly loud and obnoxious. And that was his media strategy. And he said this. He said, the only way I was going to beat out these 16 other Republicans was to be as ridiculous as I possibly could. So I've never, I think one of the new things about this is is that we, you know, fastidious Americans expect our politicians to, you know, somewhat tell the truth that here's my policy and I mean my policy. That's not Trump. Trump, the art of the deal, we have to be clear, if you want to understand this guy, the art of the deal is first say the most ridiculous thing you can possibly say and scare the opposition. And then you come back and you cut a deal that they say, wow, that's a great deal. But you actually got more because you scared the opposition first. People don't understand this is a model of the politician that we have not had and people have no idea what to make of it. I don't know how much of it is bombast uh, and show or how much of it is real. To come back to sin, you know, he really doesn't think he's a sinner. He just thinks, yeah, you make a mistake, it's okay. Why, why are you Puritans so upset with this? He's just a different kind of creature. <laughs> uh, Josh, um, you alluded to this. But, uh, there, there seem to be two schools of thought on the Republican Party in the United States. One is that the Republican Party uh, of Reagan is gone, and uh, it is, uh, it's on the verge of disintegrating. The other school is that Trump has actually energized folks who would otherwise stay at home on election day. What's your take on this? So I have a number of friends who are <clears throat> right in the thick of this, and their argument is the following. We relatively cultured conservatives. Berkey and conservatives. Um, let this rabble in uh, to extend the franchise with the understanding that we would lead. And look what it got us. And so what we're going to do is we're going to reconstitute the political party uh, without the rabble. I've written about this. It's what I call the Aristotle problem. So Aristotle believes that a statesman has to be moderate and temperate, proportional. And so these Aristotle Republicans, and this is the cultural conservatives, look at Trump and they say, he's mad, he is unfit to serve. And it's on Aristotelian ground. So they, they can only think in terms of this conservative trope uh, of moderation and temperance. And so they're going, they're going to try to completely repudiate this group. And I say, great guys, why don't you just form a philosophy book club? Because that's all you're going to do. You're going to be talking among yourselves, we the pure ones. We the modern Aristotelians. Uh, but but you, if you're not going to do a book club and do a political party, you have to make all these compromises. But the, the crisis of the Republican Party is there's simply no ground for compromise. The Republicans who are going to vote for Trump will never be forgotten by the Trumpites. And then Kagan writes a piece in the Washington Post saying that the ones who vote for Trump should never be forgiven. This is a rift that will not heal. And I don't see that the old line Republicans, even if, even if Trump loses badly, I think they've been marked. I think they can form a book club, but I don't think they can form a political party. And these are some of my very good friends. I tell them, great, let me, invite me to your book club, but this isn't a political party. Thank you. Before we open it up to the public, um, I just want to ask you a question. Now, uh, one of the um, understandings we all uh, had before uh, this evening was that neither of us, none, none of us is going to take sides and necessarily say who we're going to vote for. Or, but, but of course, 
um, um, it's, uh, uh, it's hard to uh, uh, not realize that you seem to support Hillary. And if you look at her foreign policy, she's promising a continuation of uh, uh, Obama's foreign policy. As you mentioned, uh, she's very hawkish on foreign policy. And so what we've had under uh, President Obama are extrajudicial killings or state-sponsored killings in the form of drone strikes. We've had an expansion of um, surveillance uh, uh, in, in domestic politics. Uh, and a an narrowing of, uh, of personal freedoms in terms of uh, what, uh, what can be done. Uh, there's been an incredible level of influence uh, peddling by Washington insiders, by, uh, by financial institutions. Why should we vote for Hillary? Well, everything you say is true and it worries me. Um, I was not uh, a Hillary supporter in the primaries and um, I think that um, there are now eight longtime Republican newspapers that have endorsed Clinton. They haven't endorsed Clinton because they love her. They've endorsed her because they think that Trump is catastrophically unfit. Um, two of those newspapers in 120 years have never endorsed him. Right? But when I mention the neoconservative foreign policy, this really worries me. That's actually why she lost the nomination in 2008, because Running as a woman, she figured she has to be the toughest one in the room, right? So she runs on a very hawkish program uh, at a time when the Democrats did not want a hawkish foreign policy. But um, honestly, um, you know, we have two choices, right? And so uh, from my point of view, Donald Trump uh, doesn't understand anything about the world, right? Um, if I thought he was, if I thought he could control himself, if he wasn't tweeting at 3 a.m., you know, then maybe I'd think, okay, we could take a chance on someone who comes in and tries to shake things up. But, um, you know, he's, he's not just tweeting at 3 a.m. He's got a finger on the button. But absolutely, there are many reasons not to be deeply enthusiastic, right? I'm not giving a Hillary Clinton campaign speech. Here, My thing. Right. I'm just saying, how? Why is it close? Right, when every major newspaper, seriously, almost every one, has endorsed Clinton, and it's close because of these factors. Now, both of you have thoroughly depressed us with your rather, uh, with your diagnosis of American politics. So let me add to our collective depression by asking one more question. What if we end up in a situation, in the same situation that we did in 2000, with, um, uh, with an undecided uh, electorate. And uh, now here, uh, in, in 2016, we have uh, eight justices of the Supreme Court rather than, rather than nine. Uh, what's going to happen then? So the nightmare version of this is that Pennsylvania is the state that we don't know, right? Because we can't recount Pennsylvania, right? So we're just kind of screwed, right? <laughs> and Pennsylvania doesn't have any really good laws about how they resolve it, right? Because they've never had that problem. And so read one way that the governor working with the legislature certifies, read a different way, it's a different outcome. I think we're probably going to dodge the bullet this time. It's not going to be quite that close. But we really ought to fix this problem with the... Um, with these machines that don't give receipts. And the second thing I'll say is, I said earlier that the best outcome I think would be for, the, for Clinton to win and then the Democrats to get the Senate. Or if I didn't say it, I thought it. And the reason I thought it is this, because Republicans have said they won't, they, you know, John McCain said yesterday, we won't vote on any Supreme Court nominee that Hillary Clinton puts forward. So you're talking about four years where we don't replace anyone, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the notorious RBG, probably going to have to retire, right? Uh, Clarence Thomas has talked about retiring. I mean, seriously, we can't replace anyone. <laughs> so it's just really important that we actually replace some judges. Uh, but there is a nightmare scenario. The other thing that's really interesting, by the way, is there's a third party candidate who could win Utah. He's actually within one point of the lead. Um, 
no real political experience, whatever, kind of a conservative. He's not the Libertarian Party, but uh, so there would be some really, really outside chance that if Trump surged back that we could get no Electoral College winner, period. So, so given my understanding of history of political thought, I always think that uh, politics dances over the surface of society and politics reflects what's going on in society. So the political resolution, in my view, will in no way resolve the deeper problem. And my source of despair is that I don't see how it can be resolved. I don't see, I don't see these two people talking with one another. I think in part because of the internet, they've demonized each other. The other group is stained, this language of purity and stain. So that's my deepest fear. So even if Clinton has a resounding victory, it doesn't solve the problem in society. If Trump has a resounding victory, it doesn't solve the problem in society. If there's a draw, it doesn't solve the problem of society. And so that, to me, is the biggest question, is how can we heal this tremendous wound? Let me just, if I may, talk about sure. race just for one second. So Clyde's right. There, there are lots of um, white people who support Trump, and they're talking about whiteness. Well, my view, and I mentioned this just in passing, my view is that we had a tremendous opportunity at the time of Martin Luther King. Why? Because the language they used was the oldest of the American religious languages. It was the language of the American Jeremiah. It was, we have a wound, we must be healed together. This is the fundamental religious language of America. But the Democratic Party has not adopted that language. It's deeply suspicious of conventional black Christian religion. And so what's happened is we've moved to the language of identity. And I see no possible way, especially after my two years in Iraq, where everybody's using identity, their identities. Identity is a zero-sum game. It's only in your imagination that we can build a world together based on identity. So if we, if we had this, we had this spectacular moment in the 1960s to use, continue using this Martin Luther King-like language, we have instead moved to identity politics language. So my question would be this. If the only way we can talk about identity is in terms of race, or if the only way we can talk about race is in terms of identity, what other language can the whites use except white language? I mean, we have been denied, or they have been denied the prospect of some larger integrative language of the sort that Martin Luther King has had. So do not complain, in my view, about how these whites are talking about their racial interests. The only language available is the, interest, is the language of identity. This is all you've allowed. And this is, I think, a huge problem. And this is why I, I, I wince every time Martin Luther King Day comes. Because Martin Luther King was talking about a language of, of, it's a religious language of bringing the body together, black and white children. But that's not the language we have today. And I do not think you can build a society based on identity. And that, I think, is the great failing of the democratic machine right now. Perfect. Thank you.